Send in those checks. Take care. Welcome, everybody. Here we go. It's that time again. Matt Connerton Unleashed, and we are live from the studios of WMNH 95.3 FM in downtown Manchester, New Hampshire, where it is uh, a little cloudy, but very warm, uh, beautiful day here in the city. Of course, also on Comcast 97, if you're in Manchester, uh, streaming online at WMNHradio.org. And you can go to mattconnerton.com, of course, and click Listen Live to get all your streaming options there. And hello to our friends at Raw Talk Online. And today is... Wednesday, April 7, 2021. Uh, And uh, let's see. I do want to remind you, of course, uh, we are proudly sponsored by the Hop Knot in the Brady Sullivan right across the street at 1000 Elm Street. It is Wednesday, so it is the start of their week. They're closed Monday and Tuesday. That's their weekend. But they're open today. Of course, they have delicious gourmet pretzels. They have an assortment of craft beer and wine. And Thursday nights, they do trivia night. Uh, Friday nights, our friend Grant Lampton, who called in last week right before he was uh, getting ready to get set up over there. Uh, he plays there on Friday nights and uh, very, very talented gentleman. I, I found one of his, um, I found a performance of his. He was doing a song, uh, Anything But Me by Fish. Uh, there's a cover of that that Grant does on, uh, you can find it on uh, on the YouTube. Um, and, and just incredible. Just so, so good. So, uh, but uh, yeah, he plays there on Fridays. They do Sunday brunch. Always a, a, a lot of great stuff going on there. And, um, you know, they do everything very safely there. The staff is masked at all times, even out back in the kitchen. They wear their face masks. They clean and sanitize diligently. The tables are nice and spread out. So they're very committed uh, to keeping everyone safe, not only themselves, of course, but the patrons, uh, which is so important. And it's one of the one of the several reasons why we're very honored and privileged to have them as a sponsor uh, of uh, Matt Connerton Unleashed and of WMNH. Um, so uh, please, you know, it, it is so important uh, in these times to support local businesses. And, you know, uh, the Hopknot is, uh, you know, they're part of a small, uh, th- th- there are a few other Hopknot locations. It's one of those uh, franchise arrangements. Um, they have a few in Connecticut, but uh, the one here uh, that this wonderful family, you know, our friends, uh, uh, Kenny and Trudy, um, I, I point at the couches though they're there, which they're not. But I think I just do that because when they do come on the show, that's where they sit. <laughs> it's muscle memory. But uh, our friends Kenny and Trudy and, and their wonderful family—they own the only uh, New Hampshire location, actually. So, a little fun fact for you. But it is so important to support these local businesses in these very difficult times. As I like to say, I know I, maybe I get a little carried away with the sermonizing. But I do like to remind people, you know, the big chains, the big national chains that uh, have a gazillion dollars in the bank, they're going to be just fine, my friends. They're going to be just fine. But the small, you know, the mom and pop type places, it is so important to continue to support them uh, through these very challenging times. You know, we're not out of the woods yet. We've got, uh, you know, we've got a little bit left of this pandemic, unfortunately. Um, you know, uh, we are uh, getting people. I, I'm proud to say, by the way, and we'll we'll look at it a little bit closer later in the show. But um, I saw this on my news feed this morning here in New Hampshire. Uh, this state now leads the nation in vaccinations. Hey, that kind of rhymes. I could make a song with that. I might have to uh, uh, re unveil my hip hop alter ego M Sizzle. Leading the nation in vaccinations. Uh, no, I'm not really going to do, to do that. Don't worry. I did that a couple of years ago, and I, I have regrets. I do. I admit it. But anyway, uh, we're, we're leading the nation in vaccinations, which is a wonderful thing. That's the good news. The bad news, of course, is the apparently 
the UK variant. I'm just going to summarize the entire show I have planned right at the top for no particular reason. Uh, but that just seems to be what I'm doing. Uh, the UK, but we'll get into this in more detail later, too. But the UK variant is now the dominant strain of COVID-19 in the United States. Uh, that's why the numbers are spiraling up, even though uh, we're vaccinating people in record numbers. Uh, the uh, COVID appears to also be spreading uh, very, very rapidly. And younger and younger people are getting very, very sick and getting hospitalized because this very dangerous UK variant uh, has taken hold and become so dominant. So it, it, it continues to be a very mixed picture uh, on COVID-19. But we have our first call of the day today. Hi, welcome to Matt Connerton Unleashed. Who's this? Hey, it's Ridley. Dave Ridley, how are you? Are, are, you, uh, are you gearing up for your big Sunday uh, protest at uh, the post office? I don't know if they'll be big, <laughs> but they they will happen. Okay, I mean, you know, unless the unless the God or the FBI strikes me down. Sure, sure. Well, I I would hope that uh, neither of those would happen. Uh, who do you uh, who concerns you more though, uh, the FBI or God? Well, God doesn't seem to have done anything to hurt me over the last fifty four years that I'm aware of. That uh, you know of. F- that you know of. The, the FBI hasn't really done much to hurt me either. So. Uh, so, I don't know. so it's about even. Well, I mean, it's complicated. You know how it is. Uh, oh, they, they, I guess they you know, they hurt the taxpayer by taking their money, but uh, they don't they don't they don't bust through everyone's door. Well, God's kind of in on it too, though, right? Because didn't Jesus say something about give to Caesar what uh, belongs to Caesar, or something, or what you owe to Caesar, or mm-hmm. what you uh, forgot to claim on your taxes that now you have to give to Caesar, or something like? I'm not much of a theologian, Dave. I, I probably butchered that uh, <laughs> passage, but. Uh, I'm- I'm not either. Yeah, yeah, but I have I have I have censorship news for you. Oh, that is always a very interesting topic to me. Yes, go ahead. Well, you know, there's so much going on uh, that I could probably just start calling you about censorship and not much else. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, there there is a New Hampshire-based alternative to YouTube, which I am a, have been a big fan of for a couple of years. Yes, uh, they're being sued by the Fed. The... Okay, now who is the? Uh... I feel like you've you've mentioned this on the show before, but who is the so it's a Manchester based YouTube? Who is it? Uh, it's uh, it's they're called Library L B R Y dot com. Is their URL okay? okay. Uh, and what they allowed me to do was to basically copy much of my like the most recent one thousand videos from my YouTube channel to Library, so that when the censorship hammer was you know we knew it was going to fall sooner or later, uh, that it would at least save those videos. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but what the, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I was just going to ask you, uh, so what's, what's happening now? So what the S, the SEC is the federal branch that is going after them. And they're accusing them, I guess, of like creating an unlicensed, an unlicensed, uh, security. They're, they're, they're claiming that the library token, LBC tokens are securities. Uh, I'm confused. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, I mean, what, you know, you're supposed to be confused. Because yeah. <laughs> what they're really charging them with is doing nothing harmful. <laughs> so. But who is, what, what government agency is charging uh, charging them? The Securities and Exchange Commission, I believe, is what SEC stands for. Oh, yes, yes. Okay, I'm sorry. But what, but what, uh, what does library? Uh, what does this site do other than you can post your videos onto it? Does money change hands somehow with library? Well, they created a they created a token, a crypto token, you know, kind of like Bitcoin. Oh, uh, except a lot more a lot more obscure. Okay, uh, and they're they're called LB, LBC tokens, I think. Okay, or LBC coin, and uh, they you know I don't know they they pay you LBC coins if you transfer your YouTube channel over to them, they'll pay you like a bucket load of of, uh, oh, of coins that right. are worth quite a bit actually that's uh, right so i remember been, i remember you talking about this before okay it's coming back so people to me. have pe- people have been transferring their youtube channels over uh and uh you know they're providing an outlet for people to preserve their information in the face of censorship uh so you know my suspicion is that that's what has the federal government angrier but it, you know, it could, you know, it could really be a security, you know, security token claim. Uh, who knows what that means? Um, 
Is this do you, is this in any way connected? Do you think? Do you know to what happened uh, to uh, Ian Freeman and others? Chris Wade thinks so. The guy who runs ThinkPenguin dot com. He's sort of the guy who takes filling oh. up Ian's, Ian's shoes as best he can. I mean, it's more it's a little more complicated than that. Um, but he's doing a lot of the things that Ian used to do, and uh, he believes that the two are connected. But I don't. I don't know. Other than the timing, I don't have any evidence to throw at you to say that they're connected. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, uh, you know, a, a common thread here, obviously, being having to do with uh, cryptocurrency. Um, right. You know, it's odd. I, I just uh, this is a little bit of a side street uh, to go down, but it, it's connected. I, I was um, there's a. Uh, one of the the shows I was listening to in the car on uh, on satellite radio on the the Bloomberg News Channel, somebody was talking about how eventually uh, our federal currency in the United States is is all going to become digital anyway. So it's uh, so cryptocurrency is inevitable. It's just the cryptocurrency in question will actually be the currency that we already use um, in the United States. And it was funny; I'd never quite thought of it that way be- before because I've never I've never been into the like. Personally, Dave, and I, you, you and I probably disagree on this, but I, I personally have never seen the point. Like, I've never gotten into Bitcoin or anything like that because I, I just don't see the point of it unless you're deliberately trying to hide money from the government. And if you're deliberately trying to hide money from the government, rightly or wrongly, you may end up in prison. So I've never uh, I've never uh, wanted to even uh, get anywhere near it myself. But um, but uh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> to, teach, to each their own, but uh, so what? Well, I mean, the reason I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go go ahead, Dave. Go ahead. The reason the reason people get into I don't know why they I guess they got into it at first for ideological reasons, you know, because right they you know didn't they didn't like the idea that the federal government could create money out of thin air, yeah, and thus cause inflation, um, <laughs> yeah. and that can't really apparently can't be done with Bitcoin. No one's ever managed to do it yet, so uh, that's the reason why it is now worth. 50,000 times more than the federal dollar when it started, you know, at a, at a one cent, you know, price point initially. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, but it's not, it's not something I would, uh, I, I would ever get into. So what happens to your, um, what happens to your videos on that site now on library? Is everything still intact while this is all going on or is the site come down? I'm sure. I'm sure it is. It's a federal lawsuit, not a federal raid, right? Like, they didn't right. come and shut down the service. But I'm sure those guys are furiously at work making sure they've got something, you know, backed up that's running in Slovenia or something. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And and uh, I, I don't know how it, how it will all play out. But I'm sure this is something they would have – they issued a statement, you know. I'm sure they would have thought, you know, they, they would have occurred to them that they could get targeted um, because the authorities do not like – they do not like cryptocurrency, and they do not like uh, free media. It goes right to the heart of two of the three pillars of government function, right? The government runs the money. The government runs the media to some extent. And this goes to the heart of both of those problems. Hmm. So you think that you think that the real motivation – well, okay. So you think that there's really a dual motivation there? It's not just about the, the money? It, it, it could be. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. I just, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, um, all right. Um, anything else on your mind today, Dave? There's always something else that I'll call some other time. All right. Well, go ahead and give the uh, go uh, go ahead and give the Ridley Report a plug. Uh, RidleyReport.com. It functions despite the censorship. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> all right, Dave. Thank you for the call. You're welcome for the call. All right. Bye bye. All right, Dave Ridley of the Ridley Report. Well, that opens up a line for you. Six zero three. 250-6007, 603-250-6007. You can also uh, text me at 617-917-4476, tweet me at Matt Connerton, or send an email to Matt at mattconnerton.com. And by the way, we will address the, uh, for those of you watching online or on Channel 97, you can see the big sign. I had to text Peter when I got in. I, I, I didn't know if that was a new sponsor or something, but apparently no. But there's a story here uh, behind uh, behind that and, and why it's here. And, and it has to do with a, a murder 
That occurred a long time ago. There was a cold case and then was eventually solved by our friend Bill Barry and another gentleman, Bob Friedis. So uh, maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll get in all that as well. Because I actually don't know the story, so I'm curious. And it looks like um, actually it looks like our friend Rob Dion did post that in the Facebook live chat. But let's uh, we'll take a moment and say hello. Oh, but by the way, uh, shout outs to our friend uh, Chris down at Bunny's. The uh, convenience store a couple blocks down here. I stopped in there before the show, had to get my caffeine injection. And uh, Chris is a big supporter of the shows here at WMNH. And uh, he was commenting to me how much he really loves, uh, he really enjoyed yesterday's show. He loves Gonzo, thinks he's very entertaining. Uh, we won't tell Gonzo that, though. We don't want it to go to his head. Hi, welcome to Matt Connerton Unleashed. Who's this? Hi, uh, excuse me, is that Easy G? Oh, excuse me, Easy G. N- excuse me. The uh, question, question of the day is: yes. are, you a, are you a fan of Jello? I like Jello. I don't ever actually eat it. I kind of forget. You know, I forget that it even well, exists. I get the one here. I get the one here that's sugar free. It's a ten calories per serving. Sure. I'm got, even though it's, it's technically not good for you, I got a couple uh, in advance. Here. I'm going to cut myself down to once a month. So I shouldn't be eating a ton of Jello because not really 100 percent good for you. You're going to cut your Jello intake down to once a month, is what you're saying. Yeah, once a month. Yep. Wow. Well, good for you, yeah, Easy If Daryl is Darryl, listening, he 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 would like that idea because he the uh, I did that the other day. I bought some food over at Mo Subs, and uh, Lenny used to go there all the time. Peter used to make fun of him. Good, you going to Mo Subs? He goes, "How'd you know?" So every time I go there, I think I'm a good old Lenny, and uh, I had half the sandwich for lunch, and I had half the sandwich for supper. Uh huh. Hey, this uh, this thing about the Jello. This sounds to me like breaking news. Yeah, there you go. I have, I have better breaking news. Red Sox win. Sorry, what? Everybody thought the Red Sox were dead and buried, and they just swept the uh, Tampa Bay out of Fenway. So ah, they, three they, and three now. I they, thought a rotten start, but they're, they're, that's the thing about baseball. You know, like you lose I one predicted. game, you lose a couple, and you go right back in the field, and you. And Did, you go, go, go. Didn't I predict that? Didn't I say that, that that's exactly what would happen? I, I'm quite the prognosticator when it comes to these things. Yeah, they got some, uh, they got some, uh, oh, yeah, I, I sent you a uh, a video. I, I couldn't sleep at all last night, so I, I listened to the whole, they, they cut it way down, the Hall of Fame. Of course, some of them were, were virtual because of the pandemic, you know, people from overseas, and uh-huh. Ray Kai, but they cut it way down, the, the um the uh, acceptance speeches, but after they spent a few minutes with each of them, some more, and they interviewed all of them. I sent it to you on your message thing there. So if you got time to listen to it, that well, it was really good. Wow, I will. Hey, uh, and they have some of the they have some of the wrestlers that are part of the legacy. You know, they're no longer with us. Uh huh. Of course, they talked to Ozzy Osbourne. He was only on for like two minutes. They really they wanted only ninety minutes of the show. You know they. Because some years the Hall of Fame will go on forever and ever and ever. They said, no, we're not doing that this year. Because there's no fans, you know? Right, right. It's all virtual. Hey, uh, uh, pre pre recorded. Of course, there's, there's rumors now. They're going to try to slide in Bailey for that women's uh, tag team championship match for uh-huh. the fight there, Nia Jackson, the night, the night of two. And then there's, there's rumors that uh, Ronda Rousey and the man are coming back. But they say, oh, we might make a surprise appearance at WrestleMania. Oh, I can see that. Uh, did she have her baby? Did she have a baby? I know she was she trying. She did. She did have a baby. R- Ronda Rousey had a baby? No, she didn't. She was trying, but oh, no, right. no luck. Didn't work out. Didn't work out. Uh, so I guess her contract, her contract is up on uh, April 10th, so she would have to see what have to sign a new contract before the weekend. Now, Scott Robinson in the chat room says, uh, Matt. Actually, she could come on Saturday, yeah, and not come on Sunday. But I think if she's going to come over the weekend, she, they, they want a new contract. Scott Robinson says, Matt, have you given any more thought to the new segment, Ask Eric? Oh, I, I'm all for it. How would you feel about that, Eric? A new segment where we ask you uh, uh, advice. Uh, advice about what? Well, I don't know. Uh, maybe love advice. I've done or, love advice. But I don't know how, or maybe, how successful uh, I have been with that. Maybe life advice or perhaps financial I advice. Could try that, yeah. We'd need like a disclaimer. I, I, did, I did try that with a guy we can't talk about over in the uh, state rep in Concord, but we won't. We don't talk about him anymore. Oh, right. God, I tried. It was funny. The other day, Peter White was playing that crazy Joe thing. You <laughs> yeah. give me a job in this station. 
Ah, uh, yes, our friend Crazy Joe. Even though he'll City. never call again. He left a legacy. <laughs> I, I have a feeling we'll hear from him again someday. We seem uh, to have, I don't uh, think so. He hates us. We seem to have mutual friends. I don't know. He was too sweet on Jenny, that's for sure. I know, right? He was a little too... Uh, a little it's too, funny uh, how some people are forward. really sweet on Jenny and some people uh, are not big fans of her, like uh, unfortunately the guy who just called. Dave Ridley? Yeah, I don't think it's that uh, Dave's not a fan of her, but he he's kind of a a, a jerk about well, the whole. Well, there's some pretty good arguments about the radio. about the hey, name that thing. Makes, that makes for good radio, you know. As long as I don't get too crazy, it does make for good radio. That's true. I don't think Jenny's a big fan of his uh, lately, uh, but uh, you know. Yeah, it was funny because the uh, if Ron's listening, I appreciate the love. The other day, he called up and uh, he uh, told Peter White to be nice to me. So that was nice. I enjoyed that. Oh, so are you and Peter White? Uh, because yesterday things were a bit contentious. Oh yeah, we're all, we're all good now. We're yeah, all good. we're all good. Did you apologize to him? No, the uh, he's, he um, yeah, we're all good. So that's all I can say at the moment. We're all good. You apologized, something like that. Yeah. For for what you did to upset him. Yep. What we're, all, you... we're all good. Mm-hmm. For now. Water under the bridge. Yeah. Yeah. God knows we've had plenty of uh, disagreements over the years. You sure have. It's uh, definitely, there's like oh, a love-hate thing going on there. Yeah, all right. Well, I'm, I'm, going, to, uh, <laughs> I'm going to um hang up because i I got to say some... Uh, some entertainment for tomorrow. If I spread it all out now, there'll be nothing to say tomorrow. That's like Peter White right. always said, save, save your report for the radio. Yes, your entertainment report. So you'll be calling in or, or Skyping in rather tomorrow at 4.30 p.m.? Yep, I'll be Skyping in around 4.30, yep. Very nice. Well, that sounds like and, breaking and I'll, news. And I'll leave you with this tease. I got some uh, very interesting uh, um, Amanda McCarthy, April Cushman uh, news. Oh. I finally got an answer to a question. You know, so I know people are busy and they... And, they, you know, oh, God, is Eric bothering us again? But I finally got an answer to a question I've been wondering for months. Yeah. So I'm going to announce it tomorrow on your show. Oh. Breaking news. Wow. I know these two ladies have known this news forever, but me being an entertainment reporter, you know, I can try to find out these uh, crazy stories so I can well, tell everybody the happy news. The happy news? As, is someone getting married? Uh, no, no, married. Someone having a child. No, married. Well, you know how it is when you, when you when your uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, or you or you're married. You know, April's got a daughter, a marriage. She's got a husband. She's got a farm. She runs. She's got a lot of animals. Ugh. Nothing I'd be interested in. She's listening. Sorry to hear, but I've never been a big <laughs> farm guy. <laughs> Me neither. Um, okay, so is that all some sort this, of? He's not an outdoor guy. Uh, April's got a big farm. My friend Gretchen there from Gosson High School days, 86 class. Uh-huh. She's got a bunch of horses. I don't mind the horses too much, but I'm not a big fan of uh, I've done it once or twice riding the horse, but I, felt, I just found it, found it, kind of found uh, a little bit uncomfortable. You were uncomfortable riding the horse. Did you uh, use a yeah, saddle? Have you ever done that, Matt? I have. My my grandparents had horses. Did you use a saddle did on you, the did horse? You feel like, did you feel like the, a little bit uncomfortable? I did. I I wished. Uh, I you know. I I felt like uh, Christian Lacoste not wearing a cup. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, the uh, boy seems, seems to be a lot of uh, trash talking. Yeah. Uh, I'm hoping that he doesn't. Get, I hope he doesn't get hurt. I don't. Jenny, I don't think Jenny is a uh, big fan of this fight. But he's been looking for a fight for a couple of years. He wanted to fight me. He wanted oh. to fight Texas Mike. Anybody that came through that door. Right, right. Yeah, Christian's a fighter. He's like, uh, he's always looking for a brawl, you know? I know. I hope he doesn't get hurt, though. That, that, that would be awful. Well, I think I think he's uh, going to fight this guy from Canada in June. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you're listening, Christian, I hope you don't get hurt. Oh, he's going to be... Uh, Nothing th- I'd be interested in, because I know what would happen. I would get hurt. I think he's going to be on with uh, with us tomorrow, actually. All right. Yeah. One, one punch to me or my face or my or my stomach, and I'd be on the ground, and that'd really? be the end, end of my career. Wow. Just I'm, one punch? I'm not a fighter at all. Wow. Well, yeah, in your early days, you were quite a brawler. I've heard the stories. I've heard the oh, stories. Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's not that. I mean, I like watching the stuff on on, on WWE, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Watching Doing other for, people forever get punched. Day. Yeah, yeah. But I, I can never get in the, in, in the ring. I've had I've had nightmares where I'm in the ring with Andre the Giant, and he's like 
It's like he's like. Flopping the heck out of me, and I wake up and say, "Oh God, thank God." You've had nightmares about being in a wrestling match with Andre the Giant, and I thought my dreams oh, were well, strange. King Kong Bundy or one of those guys. You've yeah, had nightmares just, about totally being beaten up by King Kong and Bundy. I wake up. You've got. Yeah, you, well, that's what happens when you watch too much wrestling. I I have strange dreams, but wow. Yeah. Wow. They're no, they're no longer with us. Uh that's true. Wait, is King King Kong Bundy's dead? Andre's dead. Is King Kong Bundy? King Kong Bundy's gone, yeah. Are you sure? Yeah, maybe you're right. Huh. Yeah. Oh, well, it's, it's funny today. I'll leave it this side. I was <laughs> called up the Peter White Morning Show, and I said, uh, uh, so, um, uh, not Dennis and Menace, but, uh, oh, um, uh, one of those old shows. Um, I forget. But anyways, I, I thought the mother had died recently, but Peter said, hey, Eric, she died 11 years ago. I said, whoops. Who died 11 years ago? Oh, uh, was one of uh, oh Beaver, Beaver Cleaver, the Beaver, Cle- the Beaver Show. <laughs> That's a discussion for uh, Matt Connerton unsheathed, uh, Eric. No, 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 it's a TV show, The Beaver. Oh yes, leave it to Beaver. Yeah, what about yeah, it? Yeah, that's not that's not a, that's not a three. I'm, uh, oh, uh, sorry, I, I I got but confused. Per- apparently, she was ninety years old, but she died like eleven years ago. So I'll talk about egg on your who, face. Who died eleven years ago, Mrs. Cleaver? Yeah. Oh, well, that's breaking news. I didn't know that. Oh, you know, sometimes on Facebook, the uh, it's not really uh, as you well know. I mean, uh, you're always on the Facebook for your 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 um, miscellaneous or your important things, and sometimes it's not always accurate. What's not always accurate? Facebook. Right. There's a lot of fake Real news. Sketchy. A lot of fake news on Facebook. Like a friend of mine told me once. He goes, Eric, and. and uh, this lady, Melissa, used to help me out with my feet and legs. She goes, Eric, don't ever go on the computer to, to look for medical advice because it's always all over the place. Right. You can't rely on it. Yeah, well, that's the thing, especially in the COVID era. Uh, a lot of people who are oh, not yeah. doctors uh, suddenly think that they are. A lot of right-wing conspiracy theorists uh, think that they can dispense medical advice. Oh, yeah, advice. leave it with this final thought. I was listening yes. to Clyde Lewis. Is that crazy or not? Clyde Lewis. And, uh, he was telling everybody about the, the Bitcoins there and how they're going to make everybody do the Bitcoins. And then if you buy the Bitcoins and you lose all your money, then you have to buy some food buckets. Food buckets, right. That, that's how you ended the show at 1 a.m. because I was up at that crazy hour. Yeah. So, oh, God. You know, you know, scare anybody for three hours. Just so you buy the Clyde. And then the other guy on on the morning show on, on GIR, he, he, he's just selling an, another brand of food buckets. It's like, oh, my God. He goes, oh, my God, he'd be lost here for 25 years. It used to be gold. What happens if the stores close and you run out of your Bitcoin and they take all your money and it's, oh, yeah. my God. It used to be gold. End all the, the world, right-wing you know? uh, talk shows would try to sell you gold. Now they're trying to sell you food buckets for when the rapture happens. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, because you're going to lose all your money in Bitcoin. So right. Then, then what are you going to do, you know? When you lose your money so if you in have Bitcoin. you 25 years worth of food, then you're all set, I guess. I guess. I mean, you know. But the food's probably pretty gross. I would assume. I would assume so. Yes. Uh, although Jim Baker makes it look like it's delicious when he eats it. Oh God. Mm-hmm. Unbelievable. All right. I'll, next time I talk to you, we'll be just around this time tomorrow. All right. Sounds I'm good, Easy G. Thank you for the call. Bye bye. All right, our friend Easy G. Eric Gagnon. I still can't believe Mrs. Cleaver passed away eleven years ago. I'm I'm devastated. Uh, well, that opens up a line for you, 603-250-6007, 603-250-6007. Uh, let's say hello to everybody in the Facebook live chat. Uh, Jenny, first one in, she says, shalom, peeps. Mike Palapita says, good afternoon, everyone. Mike, of course, from another one of our wonderful sponsors here at WMNH, Queen City Cabinetry. I hear it's in the historic Sunbeam Mall. Uh, Mike says, love the new sign. Yes, that of course is, of course, uh, from Mr. I be- buy and sell things and sell everything, rather. Uh, we'll, uh, I, I, we'll talk about that in a moment. Like I said, I think Rob Dion uh, posted a link about that in the chat room. Charles Robinson from uh, Charles Robinson. That's somebody different. That was a uh, referee in WCW. I'm sorry. Charles Richardson uh, says, uh, hey there, happy four years, dude. Charles, of course, uh, from the Charles Richardson Show and Raw Talk Online. And Charles is uh, wishing me a happy four years because this week is the four-year anniversary of Matt Connerton Unleashed being on weekday afternoons here at WMNH 95.3. So I, um, it was actually Sunday. So, uh, because it was April 4, so today, 
the reason it came up today was I happened to, uh, you know, Facebook does that thing where it shows you in the past, you know, like, uh, well, in this case, four years ago today, you shared this. And it was the original graphic uh, from uh, from the show, um, which or- originally it says in the graphic unleashed in the afternoon with Matt Connerton. And then it was kind of like, that's ah, a little long. Maybe we should just revert back to the original name of the show when it was a podcast that I started before having the wonderful opportunity to to bring the show here to uh, 95.3. But um, yeah, it was four years ago that I shared that out. So it was like, oh, ah, I'll be damned. So there you go. So uh, thank you, Charles. I appreciate it. Abigail Jem joins us and says, good afternoon. Uh, Rob Dion, uh, who is a top fan and uh, part of the WMNH family, of course, he hosts uh, Through the Stage Door here at WMNH and is the entertainment reporter on The Morning Show Thursday mornings. And he does uh, Name That Tune, which is a very popular segment. Rob says, OMG, love the sign. Native West Sider here. So know that sign well. Um Jenny said uh, there must be a story about the sign. Uh, Wayne Noel is a top fan all the way from Michigan. Uh, Dan Lavasser is in the Facebook live chat and is a top fan. Hello, Dan. Uh, Miriam Banish joins us in the chat room. She says, good afternoon. Scout had her surgery today and all went well. Scout is her dog. Very cute. Very cute dog. Uh, She is supposed to come home tomorrow. That's great news, Miriam. That is wonderful. So Rob explains regarding the sign. Uh, It was a pawn shop in Granite Square next to the garage on Main Street across from the Gulf Station. Uh, It's an empty lot now. Um, And uh, its owner met a bad demise, and he shared. I'm going to click this link. I I have another another link to it, too. So this is is from WMUR.com. And this was posted on the site back in July of 2015, but it explains it. Um, After more than a decade, a cold case killing was resolved Wednesday with a guilty plea and a sentence of 30 years to life. Arthur Collins was sentenced Wednesday, uh, years after the investigation of the death of George Jodoin. How do you pronounce that? It looks like Jodoin, but I've seen that name before, and I don't think that's how you say it. Um, Jodwin, maybe it, it's French. Um, so after, uh, I'm going to go with Jodwin for now because I'm not sure how to say it, but I apologize for, uh, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing his name. So this was, uh, years after the investigation of the death of George Do- Jodoin was reopened. Uh, Jodoin's family tearfully addressed his killer in court 13 years after he was shot. The victim's niece, Melanie Godbout, uh, said, quote, we were treated like criminals all along. You were the criminal. You can free. You ran freely for more than ten years. How could you walk around like nothing happened? Unquote. Investigators reopened the case in 2011 and re-interviewed Collins. They said they were able to poke holes in his alibi, and he changed his story. First, saying he was there, but someone else shot Joe Doyne. Investigators had Collins. Uh, make a uh, make a recorded phone call to that man to see if he would incriminate himself, but it didn't happen. They said Collins later failed a polygraph. Senior Assistant Attorney General Jeffrey Steltson said, quote, or Streltson rather, said, quote, during a subsequent interview, he admitted what he told police was not true and that he killed George, unquote. Wow. Investigators said they believe uh, Collins was murdered by money, I'm sorry, was motivated by money when he shot Joe Doyne three times uh, while he slept. The victim's brother, Bob, said, quote, George had a heart bigger than the world. If you had only asked him, he would have helped you, unquote. Over the years, suspicion was cast on others, including uh, George's friend, Rick Karen, who said he lost his family in the midst of the investigation. He brought a sign that said, 3,794 days of doubt to illustrate how long he went through the torture. Karen said, quote, this is how many days that doubt was out there that I had something to do with this crazy stuff, unquote. Collins was sentenced after pleading guilty. Uh, 
Streltson said, quote, this case was the result of a lot of hard work by a lot of different people. Sometimes you get lucky and sometimes you make your own luck. And that's what happened here. A combination of those two things, unquote. Um, and Peter White in his uh, Facebook message to me mentioned that uh, uh, it was actually our friend uh, Bill Barry, uh, along with uh, Bob Friedis, who who actually solved the case. So very nice. Bill, Bill Barry is kind of a you know, uh, people know him here as a local alderman and, uh, you know, and he, and he ran for county sheriff and whatnot. But he's also kind of a, a legendary in law enforcement. He's um, uh, we've had him on the show and talked about cold cases he's been involved in uh, in the past that he's uh, that he's solved. Um, let's see. So. So anyway, so that's uh, that's the story of the sign. Um. Melanie Law Liberty uh, joins us. Uh, oh, I get it. Okay, I didn't know what they were talking about. Uh, Jenny said something about Jello being made from horse bones. Melanie said, "I just checked. You are correct. Gelatin comes from bones." Oh my. Uh, Mike Pelopita says. Uh, George was an acquaintance of mine. We worked together at an auction when a local countertop vendor decided not to sell laminate countertops anymore. George Harvey Dupree, if I'm saying that correctly, uh, from Mass Road Lumber and myself purchased the countertop vendor's warehouse and material. Ah, interesting. Um... Tom Blanchard says, I just killed my first mosquito ever. Wow. Uh, Mike Pell- so it's Jodwin. Is that how you say it, Mike? Jodwin? Okay. Um, George Jodwin was his name. All right. So there you go. Well, let me give the numbers again, and then we'll get into some stuff. Uh, 603-250-6007, if you would like to join us. 603-250-6007. You can also text us at 617-917-4476. Tweet me at Matt Connerton, or uh, email me, Matt, at MattConnerton.com. And please follow me on Twitter if you uh, don't already. And on Instagram. Trying to get better about mentioning uh, the Instagram. Uh, let's see. Uh, you know, speaking of uh, <laughs> speaking of, we won't spend a lot of time on this. This is kind of a silly thing, and it's already quarter to five. Wow, this uh, show is flying by. But you know, we mentioned uh, Jim Baker and food buckets, and and Cl- uh, Easy G brought up Clyde Lewis, uh, who also sells the food buckets. This is a big thing, by the way. If you don't know about the food buckets, let me explain the food buckets. So. Jim Baker is the first one I became aware of. They're like these survivalist food buckets where uh, the idea is when the rapture happens, you want to have, you know, there's not going to be any food. Um, apparently, uh, I, I guess that's what happens. Uh, all the food will disappear. Maybe the food gets uh, raptured up to heaven with the people who go. I don't know how that works, but there won't be anything to eat. It, it, it's going to be... Uh, uh, just just an apocalyptic hellscape, and I, I assume all the crops will die, or maybe there will be a nuclear winter and nothing will grow. Who knows? It'll be very exciting, whatever it is. But the idea with the food buckets is, so when the rapture happens and there's no food, you're going to need, you know, you'll be going to your underground bunker, uh, presumably, and there will be your food buckets, so you have food to eat. And... They've demonstrated this on Jim Baker's show. You know, it's like you, you pour the water in and then you have uh, instant macaroni and cheese or something. So, um, I've never understood exactly the idea here with the food buckets because it seems to me you're marketing them. If you're Jim Baker, for example, you're marketing them to the very people who wouldn't need them, right? You see where the hole in the logic is here, right? If you're someone who believes in what Jim Baker is telling you, then in theory, wouldn't you be one of the people who is raptured? Therefore, you get to go to heaven. You're not going to need the food buckets. It's it's the poor SOBs like me who are left behind. Left behind, which is a book series and movies uh, starring Kirk Cameron. I'm sure they're horrendous. But it's going to be the people like me who are left behind who are going to need the food buckets. Except I don't believe in buying the food buckets. So I won't have any food buckets. I'll just starve. And then I guess I'll end up in hell after I'm dead. I don't know. But anyway, so um, 
This has nothing to do with food buckets, but I did see this, and I thought this was kind of fun. Because we haven't done anything from rightwingwatch.org for a while involving Jim Baker. Uh, Jim Baker, this is what it says here. This just went up today. Jim Baker is now using his End Times broadcast to warn about zombies. Uh, And this is not from The Onion. This is from rightwingwatch.org. This is real. Uh, It says here, for years, right-wing pastor Jim Baker has been using his daily television program to terrify his audience into believing that the end times are upon us, often for the apparent purpose of selling them products designed to help them survive the apocalypse, like the food buckets. Uh, Baker kicked things up a notch on Tuesday's program, which featured right-wing conspiracy theorist Steve Quayle warning about aliens, demons, transdimensional beings, and diseases that are designed to initiate cannibalism in human beings and turn them into literal zombies. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what, this has my attention. If this is real, see, I always, you know... The zombies are a big deal, right? Uh, you know, there's these television shows like The Walking Dead and whatnot, and I always assumed that that was fiction, but maybe it's a documentary. I've never actually sat down and watched it. But uh, let's hear some of this. Uh, we have some audio of this, uh, you know. And by the way, by the way, I know that some of you think this is very silly, but I am going to share this with you. And, you know, if you're new to the show, we do have an unofficial policy around here. When I play something like this, I would like for us all to listen, not only with open minds, but with open hearts as well, if, if, if we can do that, please. All right, here we go. Let's uh, see. Zombies that are on the earth are a disease like any other disease that affects people and they become like zombies. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Forgive me, but that's only part of the story. Oh. Zombies as zombies also have the evil spiritual entity known as demon possession, okay? Uh-huh. Mm. Because there is no rationale with a zombie. Uh, the best way to explain zombies' bloodlust is this, the appetite of demons expressed through humans. Mm. It should be astonishing to people that the richest people in the world, not all of them, but some of them, are into occult ceremonies where they have to drink, you know, blood that's that's extracted from a tortured child. Mm. Now, that's sick. But that's the appetite of demons expressed through humans. Uh-huh. The ancient world dealt with monsters, mythological and real. And this is something... By the way, I just, I'll just i play the rest of it, but I just want to interject for a moment. I'll, I'll tell you what, I'm glad I'm listening with an open mind and an open heart. I, I went into this thinking that this would all be uh, completely insane, but so far it sounds uh, relatively reasonable. I mean, you know, rich people drinking blood and stuff. I mean, that, uh, you know, I mean, come on. I mean, we all know. I mean, look, Jeff Bezos, uh, that guy, I'm pretty sure drinks blood. Uh, can I just say that? Let's, I just want to go on record saying that uh, I've always kind of suspected that. I mean, he's the richest man in the world, if I'm not mistaken. He's probably uh, he probably drinks uh, entire buckets of it just to uh, regenerate himself or something. Anyway, something that is really important to get through: the disease will basically destroy. The human defenses, God gave us defenses as humans Mm -hmm. to resist the devil and he will flee. But when you're Uh, inviting, mm. or what's the word I want? Embracing abject demon possession, giving yourself over. By the way, uh, uh, in high school, uh, some friends and I had a death metal band called Embracing Abject Demon Possession. Uh, You know, I mean, we never really made it out of the garage uh, and we didn't record anything. But, uh, you know, but we used to play with the, you know, we'd light some candles in a dark room at midnight. And, you know, we did. We we cranked out some metal riffs. You know, there was was some good stuff. I wish we had recorded it. To be inhabitant, Mm. be inhabited Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by the demons who then become your inhabitants. Mm -hmm. It's a twofold. What I'm saying, Jim is they can induce zombieism, at least the appetite for human flesh. Yeah. But at the at the end of the thing, it's both hands, right hand and left hand. And the left hand simply is the evil spiritual possession of that zombie. Now, by the way, uh, my favorite band 
uh, Kiss. Uh, they have a song called Unholy, which is from my favorite Kiss album, Revenge. It came out in 1992. And one of the lyrics in Unholy is uh, sung by Gene Simmons, of course, from the left hand of power comes the father of lies. So, you know, it all really, uh, it, it all ties together what this guy's saying. I'm genuinely surprised at how... Uh, you know, I mean, this is, uh, boy, it's it's opened my eyes. You know, I'm kind of worried now about the demons and the uh, the zombies and the zombie demons and the demon zombies, uh, you know, as I think we all should be. So the the zombie protocol, and then I think people should say, okay, if this is all wild stuff, why does the military have a manual about it when it happens? Uh, what? <laughs> Why did what? If this is all wild stuff, why does the military have a manual about it? Um I do know this this I do know. There is a book about what to do. I've seen it. I've 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 known people who have it, a book about what to do when the zombie apocalypse happens, but it's 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 a joke. It's it's just a funny book. It's not Is that what this guy's referring to? Why does the CDC even have anything on their on their members? Center for Disease Control or Creation. I call it that. That's my opinion. The whole subject of zombies could be just boiled down at one end to a genetically modified human. That- Wait, is is he saying that is there something on the CDC website about zombies? I mean, you know, all this time we've been so worried about uh, about uh, COVID. I mean, uh, zombies might be an even bigger threat. I'm starting to wonder. That is no longer human on the level that you and I or a living being is. Then that corpse, that walking, and, and animated, there's a better word, it's not living. An animated corpse is possessed by a demonic entity. That demonic entity has knowledge, it has sentiments, it has... This is what they, I realize something now. This is why they pass these laws, like in Georgia, these laws restricting voting rights. They're worried about, because this is what they mean when they talk about dead people voting. They're, they're, they're zombies. They're, they're zombies who've been uh, animated. These zombie corpses, whatever, they've been am- animated by these demons. And then, uh, of course, of course, they go and vote Democrat. That's probably, look, uh, maybe the zombies actually stole the election for uh, for Biden. Uh, How do I say this? A purpose to do nothing else but to destroy. And I think that's the easiest way I can explain it. Mm. Mm. All right. Well, uh, let's see. Jenny says it's real, and she shared a link from the CDC in the chat room. And let's see. Let's take a look at this. Zombie preparedness. Whoops. Trying to Trying to click it. Here we go. Zombie preparedness. This is from uh, cdc.gov. Uh, wonder why zombies, zombie apocalypse, and zombie preparedness continue to live or walk dead on a CDC website. As it turns out, what first began as a tongue-in-cheek campaign to engage new audiences with preparedness messages has proven to be a very effective platform. We continue to reach and engage a wide variety of audiences on all hazards preparedness via zombie preparedness ah very good very good well okay so there is a a thing about zombie uh, preparedness on the cdc website that's uh that makes sense that makes sense joe friday joins us in the facebook live chat he likes the uh, mr buy and sell everything sign uh ah. all right yeah he loves the sign um <laughs> Oh boy. I'm just uh let me back up on the uh Facebook <laughs> comments here. <gasps> Abigail says I want to hear the cranberries zombie now. Maybe I'll play that at the break. That's a good call. Maybe I'll play that and I'll play Unholy by Kiss. Um <laughs> All right. Uh, 
Melanie says, uh, how does one confirm blood comes from a tortured child and not one at Disneyland? That's a great point, Abigail. Jenny uh, said, uh, with a certificate of authenticity. That makes sense. That makes sense. Wow. Well, I think we've uh, we've learned a lot, haven't we? <laughs> so there you go. So much about zombies. All right. Well, I think what we'll do is uh, we're coming up on, on the top of the hour. I am going to play a couple of uh, songs, and then we'll come back, and we have some some real, actual, uh, serious, or at least uh, somewhat uh, serious things to discuss uh, here on the program today. And I do want to talk about, too, um, the wonderful progress uh, that's been made uh, here in New Hampshire. As I mentioned earlier, we lead the nation in vaccinations, which is uh, pretty awesome. So let's do that by request. Oh, Peter White suggests, or all you zombies by the Hooters. It's another great pick. (laughs) Here's some cranberries. All right, we're going to take a break, play a couple songs, and then we'll be back. More Unleashed coming up. Don't go away. Saying something like that, you know, you could, if you were like a national talk show host, you could just say that you can have you show you ain't off the air, or, or they could be protesting your offices or something like that. Welcome back, everybody. We are into our number two numero dos of Matt Connerton Unleashed, and we are live from the studios of WMNH 95.3 FM in glorious downtown Manchester, New Hampshire. The sun is shining. It was a little cloudy when I started today, but the sun is shining. It's gorgeous out. We're also on Comcast 97, of course, in Manchester, streaming at WMNHradio.org. And you can go to MattConnerton.com if you'd like and click Listen Live and find all your streaming options there, as well as how to contact the show. The phone numbers are there. All my social media links are there. Everything you could ever want or need. Well, regarding the the show, of course. It's all right there for you. Uh, Today is Wednesday, April 7, 2021. Uh, The number to call is 603-250-6007. 603-250-6007. You can also... uh, Text me at 617-917-4476. Tweet me at Matt Connerton or send an email to Matt at MattConnerton.com. But the best thing to do so that we can hear and enjoy your dulcet tones is call us at 603-250-6007. And, of course, you can always interact and opine in the Facebook live chat as well. Uh, Melanie, uh, I'm sorry, Miriam Banish rather says, I just talked to Scout's surgeon and all went very well picking her up tomorrow. That is excellent news. Scout, of course, uh, Miriam's uh, beautiful dog. I've seen the pictures online and uh, needed uh, heart surgery and it sounds like everything went well. So that is great. Uh, Stefan Philbrook, who is a top fan in the chat room, says, uh, holy hooters. It's like I'm back at Hillside High with Peter White. Yes, we were talking about zombies earlier. So uh, Abigail Jem suggested, uh, zombie by uh, by the Cranberries and Peter White suggested all you zombies by the Hooters. Uh, Jenny uh, also says uh, nice pick. Uh, she enjoy- I'm not sure which song, but um, a couple of classics. Uh, our friend uh, Scott Perry is in the Facebook live chat. By the way, mentions that his podcast uh, courtesy call. Uh, there will be a new episode, episode 13, coming up this Sunday. Uh, great political podcast done by our friend uh, Scott Perry. So. Uh, love to see that. Um, I wanted to uh, mention. Well, let's do. Let's do this first. Let's do some good news. Good news around COVID. Um, so this I had referred to earlier, but uh, just a little more detail here. Uh, this is from WMUR.com. Gives us uh, some bragging rights here in the Granite State. Uh, New Hampshire leads country in distributing COVID nineteen vaccines. Uh, state prepares to transition away from fixed vaccination sites. It says here, 
New Hampshire is number one in the country in distributing the allocated COVID-19 vaccines. But Governor Chris Sununu said now's not the time for a victory lap. That is true. Uh, Daily new cases are up 20 percent compared to last week, showing that the virus is still spreading in the state. But figures from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention show New Hampshire is well ahead of neighboring states in delivering shots. So that's some good news. Uh, To date, uh, New Hampshire has received 843,385 doses of vaccine and administered 7,996,674 of them, or 94.46%. According to the CDC, Massachusetts ranks ninth in the country, uh, which obviously affects us here in New Hampshire because they are directly to our south. Uh, distributing 88% of doses received. Maine is 11th on the list, and Vermont ranks 27th. 27th? Get it together, Vermont. Jeez. But I'm glad Massachusetts is, you know, 9th. That's pretty good. But we're number one. Sununu said, quote, We're not at the point where we should be taking victory laps on anything. We are still in the thick of it. We are working so hard just trying to get the vaccine out. Right, and that's... um. There's a little bit more to this, but this is, you know, we, we talk about it a lot on the show. We're in a race against the variants. The vaccinations are going well, obviously, and I'm very proud that we're in a state that's number one. I, I do think being in a smaller state is uh, is an advantage. And New Hampshire is a small state. What are we? I think our population is, what, a million four? So, um, so I think that helps. And, you know, I'm very proud of the fact that we have... Uh, a pro-science uh, Republican governor. He's he's the only, you know, I've been very open about it. He's the only Republican I voted for in the 2020 election because, uh, and the way the Republican Party is going, he may be the last Republican I ever vote for, but uh, he is a pro-science Republican, which shouldn't be a big deal in theory, but that's kind of like a unicorn these days, I think, a pro-science Republican, you know, and, and, he's, um, and he's leaned into the science and he's, uh, you know, uh, really um, taken seriously the advice and the counsel of epidemiologists and virologists who are, you know, experts on this. And um, and and I think it has paid off. Uh, I think uh, Governor Sununu has done an excellent job on this. And, and also, you know, federally, I give the Biden administration an A plus. But I but I think our governor has done uh, has done a great job. That doesn't mean that there aren't other problems I have with uh, Governor Sununu. But but on this, I think he's been excellent. And, um, you know, and I, I, I give him uh, I give him a lot of credit. But as he mentioned him, himself, you know, uh, now is not the time to take a victory lap. Um, a 20 percent increase in new cases is not good. And it's part of it is, you know, part of it is all the people who never took it seriously to begin with, obviously. Part of it is uh, people letting their guard down too soon. And and also, I think a big part of it is these variants, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the U.K. variant, which is far more transmissible and is making younger people very sick and leading to more hospitalizations. Uh, that variant is now the dominant variant in the United States and is in all 50 states. But we have a call. Hi, welcome to Matt Connerton Unleashed. Who's this? Hey, it's Christian. I'm young, but I'm not sick. But I, I called in to congratulate you on four years. Oh, thank at, you. At WMNH. I know it's a little late in the show, but I've, I've been busy. So I just wanted to call you and congratulate you. Well, thank you. Because I see how much work you put into this show. Oh. Especially living with you and all those late, late nights, man. Yes, yes. Well, thank you very much, Christian. I appreciate that. And you're uh, you're coming in with me tomorrow, correct? Yes, sir. Outstanding. Well, that'll be fun. And EZG is going to be doing his entertainment report tomorrow, so you'll be here for that. Oh, lovely. Yes, he'll be Skyping in. That'll be very exciting. Huh. Well, I will clear up the phone lines. <laughs> All right, Christian. Thank you for the call. Thank you, Matt. All right, you got it. Bye-bye. All right, Christian Lacoste, training for a big fight in, in uh, hopefully in June. Uh, so it says here, Coos County, or uh, Coos County, as former uh, senatorial candidate uh, Scott Brown once said, for those of you who remember that. Coas County is leading all New Hampshire counties by a significant margin with 25% of its population inoculated. That's more than double the percentage in Hillsborough County, where 12% of residents are vaccinated, according to the CDC. 
Sununu said, quote, so I don't focus on any individual data point. It's nice that we are doing well, and I think overall we are doing well, unquote. The state's strategy for distribution is tailored for rural versus urban. You know, we are largely a rural state. And vaccine supplies coming into the state determine how much each county is allocated. Sununu said, quote, how we distribute the vaccine in those areas can be very different. And I think the team has done a really good job appreciating those differences and making sure it's available to everyone, unquote. Another point of pride for state officials is the high vaccination rate among New Hampshire health care workers. Sununu said, quote, we have a lot of folks in our health care workforce. I think we are number one in the country for getting our health care workers vaccinated. And I think that gives a lot of confidence to the general public as well, unquote. New Hampshire Motor Speedway will host another mass vaccination event this weekend. But the state's fixed sites are phasing out soon. Sununu said, quote, I think over the next few weeks, we're going to try to get more doctors and more pharmacies to come on board and be part of the long-term solution for individuals. The state does not plan to be in the vaccination game for the long term. We are here as part of the crisis, and I think we've done a good job, and now we'll get it back into the more traditional health care system, unquote. Sununu said, granted, staters should expect to see an aggressive approach over the next few weeks to transition away from 211 and fixed site vaccination locations so there you go um now continuing with some good news uh which one do we want to go to first let's uh let's do this so this is from uh, cnbc the imf the uh, international monetary fund uh, it says here, increases global growth forecast says crisis end is increasingly visible. And apparently they're expecting uh, 6% growth. Um, we'll get into that more in the article. But let me let me just say before we get into any of the details there, I am, and I've mentioned this before, I have been pleasantly surprised at the optimism of economists, you know, across the spectrum, because, you know, there are different, you know, you've got Keynesian economics. I guess we're all Keynesians now, if you take into uh, account the stimulus and you've got, you know, on more conservative supply side uh, economists and so forth. But, you know, there are different economic theories, and that's why we call them theories. The, you know, economics is never an exact science. There are different theories, different schools of thought on how to approach it. But um, across the board, I have been pleasantly surprised for a while now at at the level of optimism that economists seem to have about the elasticity elasticity that's a hard word to say the elasticity of the economy the ability of the economy to bounce back from the terrible contraction that was caused by and it really started with the 15 days to slow the spread uh, that uh, Trump and Pence uh, began. And that was, you know, that was the beginning of, you know, kind of shutting everything down. And speaking of zombies, I heard uh, Sam Cedar on Majority Report say, you know, we've got this sort of this zombie economy that that continues to function in some way and continues to exist, even though so much of it is ground to a, to a halt, you know, and, and we had to have the federal government kind of come to the rescue and and uh, start bailing people out and administering these loans and all the different things that the government has done, that the Fed has done, and, and so on. Um, nobody really knew for sure at the beginning of this what was going to happen. We knew at the beginning that we were likely entering a period that would be on par in its devastation uh with the great depression right that was kind of the assumption was we were entering a new great depression that we were going to see you know 25 percent unemployment and you did see food lines you know and 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 they're still and they're still happening particularly in texas and and i mean before you know be- before they had that uh the, the the terrible winter event that no one expected. You know, they 
people there were just starving. All kinds of all kinds of things. However, by by some metrics, it never got as bad as people were worried about. And the other big question, the other thing that we didn't know going into this was how quickly the economy might snap back or would it snap back at all? Or would this be a long, hard slog like coming out of the Great Recession? During the Obama administration, we saw a recovery. We saw an economic recovery, and we saw consistent economic growth, and it did increase over the course of the Obama administration, But which was good, but at the same time, it was a very slow grind. It was a very sluggish. It was not a robust, rapid recovery, right? It was a very slow recovery, and, you know, there there are elements of the economy that some would argue never fully recovered. But this was an open question very early in this crisis, right? And and I will say, and and it will surprise some of you to say this, and you know, you know how I feel about the guy, so I don't like to give him credit for much, but fair is fair. Trump may have been right about something. You know what they say about a broken clock twice a day or a blind dog gets a bone once in a while. There is something Trump might have been right about. So Trump said, um, you know, when they were doing the 15 days to slow the spread. Now, granted, what Trump said was, you know, on top of a mountain of of BS about how, you know, this is only going to take 15 days and this will pass and everything will be normal by Easter and all that, right? But Trump did say that he believed in what is called the V-curve and that the economy, after we got through this, the economy was going to snap back. Now, again, he was full of lies and BS and misdirection and, and, and misleading us about what you know, the severity of the crisis and what was really going to happen. And, you know, he was trying to be the sunny optimist, but it's like, okay, that's fine. But also tell me the truth. What did he tell Bob Woodward? Well, I didn't want to panic anybody. Well, you know, we're adults. Panic us. Tell us the truth. Tell us what's really going on. But but the part that Trump may have, in fact, been right about was this, very very specifically, because there was so much he got wrong. So we're talking on a micro level here, but but he may have been right when he talked about how the economy was going to snap back quickly. Now, Biden talks about it being a K-shaped recovery, which is where you have wealthy people whose fortunes have only increased to have thrived during this pandemic. And that's the upper part of the K. And the lower part of the K, the descending part is all the people who've been economically displaced and devastated by the pandemic who have not recovered and who are still continuing to suffer because the pandemic still isn't over. Um, However, so whether you want to go with the K or the V, I kind of look at it this way. So the K is what's happening now and what's been happening. If you want to call that a recovery... But the real recovery, which is, I would say, when do we want to say the real recovery starts? When the pandemic ends, I guess, right? When is the pandemic officially over? When we hit a certain number of vaccinations, when we reach herd immunity, maybe, if we reach herd immunity. But at some point, I I do think there is a V. Trump may turn out to be right that the economy is going to snap back and there will be all this pent-up demand because uh, the IMF is forecasting um, some pretty big growth very, very quickly. So much so that there are concerns, you know, they they even talk about uh, the risk of the economy overheating. If the economy is expanding too quickly, if it gets too good too fast, then you might see inflation Uh, begin to go up you know you actually it's one of the things that's so fascinating about all this you want a robust economy that's growing but you actually don't want the economy growing too quickly there is a danger in having an economy that is growing too quickly because then you have bubbles in the economy that could burst 
and send the economy spiraling back down and all this. It, it, it's fascinating. I, I, I know very little about it. I'm not even good at math. But the little bit that I do know about economics, it really is very fascinating. So this is what uh, CNBC is saying. So the IMF increases global growth forecast, says crisis end is increasingly visible. And again, the reason this is so good and so encouraging is because we really didn't know. Look, we didn't know when this started because it's unprecedented. You know, I mean, if you go back to the Great Depression, you had the stock market tanking. You had a run on the banks. Um, You had all these factors that were beyond our control. With this, with this... uh, if you want to call it a depression, I guess you can call it a depression. We initiated this. This was our own doing. Where we basically put the economy on pause. This had never been done before. So we didn't know. Is it as simple as just unpausing it? And in, in, a, in, a, in, a grand, in the grand scheme of things, it may be. I mean, not literally that simple, obviously, but in in a larger nuanced sense, it may be, it may turn out to be as simple as just unpausing and the economy resumes. Um, There there are certain elements of it that will take years to recover, but in in a larger sense, you know, we might be okay here. (laughs) Let me put it that way. All right, so... Uh, It says here, the latest round of fiscal stimulus in the U.S., along with vaccine rollouts across the world, these are bullet points, have made the organization, the IMF, more confident about the global economy this year. The IMF expects the world economy to grow by 6% in 2021, up from its 5.5% forecast in January. For advanced economies, the IMF estimated growth of 5.1%, with the United States set to expand by 6.4%. Stefan in the chat room says, the stimulus money released by giving a false... uh, By giving a false V... The 2017 are eliminating middle... I'm not sure what you're saying there. I'm not quite... I'm not quite getting what you're saying there, Stefan, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave that. Um, but it says here, so the IMF is expecting a stronger economic recovery in 2021 as COVID-19 vac- uh, uh, vaccine rollouts get underway. But it warns of daunting challenges given the different rates of administering shots across the globe. The organization said Tuesday it expects the world economy to grow by 6% in 2021, up from 55 in January. Looking further ahead... Global GDP uh, for 2022 is increasing by 4.4% higher than an earlier estimate of 4.2. IMF chief uh, economist uh, Jita Japanath uh, said in the latest World Economic Outlook report, quote, even with high uncertainty about the path of the pandemic, A way out of this health and economic crisis is increasingly visible, unquote. All right, Stefan. Oh, Stefan was saying V-curve. Okay, so the stimulus money released is giving a false V-curve is what he's saying. The 2017 tax cuts are eliminating the middle class and will crush the lower lower class. Income inequality will continue to haunt us for decades. Well, that's a that's a I understand what you're saying, Stefan. That's a little uh I'm trying to be optimistic. Uh the latest round of fiscal stimulus in the US, along with the vaccine rollouts across the world, have made the group more confident about the global economy this year. Uh Japoneth, or however you say that, I'm terrible with names today, uh, added, quote, nonetheless, the outlook presents daunting challenges related to divergences in the spread of in the speed of recovery, both across and within countries and the potential for persistent economic damage from the crisis, unquote. I'm going to skip down. So let's focus on the United States here. So it says here in this part, recovery in the U.S. The latest forecasts suggest 
that the United States is well-paced to experience a solid economic recovery in 2021, in contrast to much of the world, where it's likely to take longer to return to pre-crisis levels. The positive assessment for the U.S. is highly driven by President Joe Biden's $1.9 trillion coronavirus rescue package, which came into force last month. Unemployment in the United States is expected to fall from 8.1% in 2020 to 58 this year and to 4.1 in 2022, according to the latest IMF projections. And by the way, what is, just to interject, what do we consider full employment? Is it 4%? I, I guess it depends on who you ask. But and, and, and I realize also there are some who say and who have said since the Great Recession, really, since the beginning of that more than a decade ago, uh, you know, 12, 13 years ago, that, you know, the unemployment rate isn't necessarily the best indicator or at least the best leading indicator to use. And perhaps the labor participation rate is a more accurate way of measuring real because we talk about the unemployment rate and then we talk about the real unemployment rate and those don't match up. And the real unemployment rate is actually higher than the unemployment rate because the unemployment rate is a measure of how many people are filing, how many new unemployment applications you're getting each week. Um, And it doesn't count that's the real problem with the unemployment rate. It it counts people currently on unemployment. It doesn't count people who have fallen off the rolls. In other words, people who have given up looking for work, but who are no longer eligible to collect unemployment. Um, in February, by, by the way, actually, before I go on, let me just clarify. I'm not saying that the forecast for the unemployment rate to continue to, to decrease. I'm not dismissing that as not being important it is important and it is a valid economic indicator i'm just saying that there are many who would argue that it's not you know it's not the unemployment rate is not the end-all be-all and it's not the only thing that matters about the economy just like the stock market some people (laughs) some people talk about the stock market like like that is the end-all be-all indicator of how the economy is doing but it's absolutely not uh, we've seen many instances <laughs> where the stock market is is doing gangbusters while the rest of the economy, the actual economy in which people are living and working every day, is not doing well at all, right? <laughs> we've seen many examples of that. Um, that's why Kai Rizdahl of uh, Marketplace, the host of Marketplace on NPR, he always says, look, the economy is not the stock market and the stock market is not the economy. And I would just say, same with the unemployment rate to a lesser degree. The unemployment rate is not the economy and the economy is not the unemployment rate. Okay, so it says here in February, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen said the U.S. could return to full unemployment in 2022. She said, quote, there's absolutely no reason why we should suffer through a long, slow recovery, unquote. The IMF's latest forecasts confirm that the U.S. is on track to not only return, but exceed its pre-pandemic performance this year. Japonath, I realize I pronounce her name the same, I, I, differently every time I say it because I don't know how to say it. She said, quote, Among advanced economies, the U.S. is expected to surpass its pre-COVID GDP level this year, while many others in the group will return to their pre-COVID levels only in 2022. Either way, I mean, that's still really good. Um, Let's see, what was the other... There was something else about that I wanted to look at. Um, how much time do we have? Yeah, we have, uh, we have time. Uh, NBC News on that same subject, just briefly. Uh, JP Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon says economic boom could easily run into 2023. Uh, Diamond attributed the potential boom to consumer savings, a stimulus boost, Biden's infrastructure plan, successful vaccines, and, quote, euphoria around the end of the pandemic. Uh, We won't get into the details about that, but um, there's also, though, this ongoing question about, 
you know, we continue to rack up a lot of debt, and when do we finally hit a wall with that? And then uh, the president has unveiled his new infrastructure package, which is going to be very, very expensive, but you have to do it. You have to spend money on infrastructure. You can't have a crumbling roads and bridges, which is actually, I realize, a very reductive way to even discuss infrastructure, but it's uh, it's an easy example of why it's so important. Um, but before we go on to that, I want to spend a few minutes on that. Uh, 603-250-6007 is the number to call. 603-250-6007. You can text me at 617-917-4476. Tweet me at Matt Connerton or shoot an email to matt at mattconnerton.com. And you can, of course, uh, speak up in the Facebook live chat as well. Um, but uh, Biden has unveiled his infrastructure package, uh, according to the Hill.com. Uh, he says compromise is inevitable on the infrastructure plan. Uh, he wanted to. Um, <laughs> whenever he mentions compromise, I feel like he's really talking about Joe Manchin, Democrat from West Virginia, who. Uh, <laughs> Who, who may at any day just uh, flip and become a Republican. I don't know. But uh, according to The Hill, it says uh, President Biden said today that compromise on his infrastructure and jobs proposal is inevitable, but insisted that inaction was not an option. By the way, I was listening to him speak while I was uh, in the car on my way here today, and he was talking about the importance of infrastructure in so many ways you know we we often think of infrastructure as just being you know the example that i mentioned roads and bridges and we do have a lot of crumbling not literally crumbling bridges but you know red listed bridges even oh, just right here in new hampshire we have red listed bridges that are uh potentially dangerous if they do begin to crumble nobody wants a collapsing bridge and god knows our roads need work and i'm sure that's the case in every state across the country. So you have to spend money on infrastructure, but you also have to realize that infrastructure is not just roads and bridges. And I think what, what the president tried to put across today in his comments was we need to get ahead of the game on infrastructure because it's also about technology. It's also about having access to the Internet, to high-speed Internet. I don't know if it's still the case now, and it probably isn't. I remember having, it was definitely, it was well over a decade ago, so that's why this may no longer be the case. But I remember being stunned having a conversation with someone who who was uh, running a business who lived in the north country of New Hampshire, up north, who was saying that where she lived, um, they still had dial-up internet. They, they didn't have uh, broadband or high-speed internet up there. They were still on dial-up. Now, hopefully that's not still the case in 2021. But what the president was saying today was, he was saying, look, countries like China, they're already ahead of us on technology. They're not going to wait for us to catch up. This is imperative. We need to, if we're going to continue to try to be the world's superpower, and some would say that China has already caught up with us in a larger sense and, and surpassed us even, which is scary to think about. But if we're going to continue to compete as a global superpower, we need to rethink infrastructure and understand it's not just about roads and bridges. It is about technology and communication. And there's a lot that we need to do. Also, too, um, you know, he talked about Flint, Michigan and said, you know, there's hundreds of other Flint, Michigans throughout the United States where they don't have clean water, you know, because uh, water is still traveling through lead pipes to get to people's faucets. And these are all things that we need to be thinking about and that we need to be working on and that we need to kind of broaden out how we think about infrastructure and that we have to spend the money. You have to spend the money on infrastructure. It's a very difficult thing to argue against. Even for, I, I would say, the most uh, fiscally conservative among us, how do you argue against spending money on infrastructure? It's something you kind of don't have a choice <laughs> about spending money on. You have to get it done, right? So uh, here's what, what 
were some of Biden's remarks. Again, this is from TheHill.com. Quote, compromise is inevitable. Changes are certain. We'll be open to good ideas and good faith negotiations. But here's what we won't be open to. We will not be open to doing nothing. Inaction simply is not an option, unquote. Uh, The White House says that Biden plans to meet with Republicans and Democrats after they return to Washington next week on how to move forward. Biden specifically said yesterday he is open to negotiation on, on how to pay for the package after Republicans and Senator Joe Manchin, Democrat of West Virginia, but... I would say by far the most conservative Democrat in the House, in the uh, Senate, rather, uh, expressed opposition to his proposal for a hike in the corporate tax rate to 28 percent. Now, if I recall correctly, so during the Obama administration, and I think Biden had even brought this up in his remarks, um, Biden and Obama agreed at the time with Republicans that the corporate tax rate was too high. I think, what was it, 35%? So they agreed to lower it, but then the Trump administration came in, and with Republicans, they lowered it all the way to 21%. And they took an, you know, there was an enormous gamble taken Not that anyone ever cares about the consequences, really. They just care about getting to the next election. But what they tried to sell us on was, again, it's it's this classic supply-side nonsense that doesn't work. They, you know, that that's why, for example, I mean, we had enormous deficits under Reagan. Because that was when when we really kind of got into that mode of of using supply-side economics. This idea that you can drive down the corporate tax rate, don't tax rich people, don't tax big companies, don't tax corporations any more than you absolutely need to, because the less you tra- the less you tax them, uh, the more people they can hire, the more money they have to to invest, the more they can do, and um, and and that way you actually grow the tax base. Because these all these companies will be flourishing and and contributing to the tax base, but it doesn't work. See, if that actually if it actually worked that way, I'm not saying you should do the opposite and overtax everybody, and you should overtax uh, business. I'm not saying that at all. But it, w- if you tax them too little, see if that if that theory actually worked, why not why not drive the corporate tax rate? Why not tax them, I don't know, 5%, 6%? Why not, right? If the less you tax them, the more they're going to flourish and the more they're going to be putting back into the economy. It doesn't work that way. That's not how it balances out. The accounts don't balance that way, right? So what they tried to sell us, though, was the classic supply-side scam. Well, we're going to really lower taxes on on uh, corporations, and that will help them to be so successful that actually more money will be going into the treasury and it's a lie and people fall for it. It, It's like, uh, you know, one of the really remarkable things that I think Republicans have been very successful at the Republican party has been very successful at over the past several decades is convincing poor rural Americans I mean, it really is stunning when you think about it. Convincing a whole lot of poor people, poor white rural Americans who vote Republican, convincing them that under no circumstances should we expect rich people to have to pay a lot of taxes. (laughs) They have successfully convinced poor people Over the generations, we must protect rich people at all costs. And if that means that, well, you have to pay a little more as poor people, oh, well, you'll take it, right? Because we have to protect the rich. Because the rich are the quote-unquote job creators. And, by the way, even supply-side economists... You know, if you uh, talk to them about it, 
Uh, if you research this, you'll find even they say, well, actually, you know, really the 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 engine the engine that drives the economy in this country it's it's small to mid sized businesses. It's not the big corporations, right? But for some reason, it's the super wealthy who we absolutely must protect at all costs. And the Republican Party, I mean, probably even before Reagan, I don't know. I mean, for my my uh, sphere of consciousness, it was, you know, I when, when I grew up, Reagan was president. And that's, you know, and I, I got interested in politics at a very young age. So I remember this. Uh, yeah, Reagan convinced poor white rural Americans that we must protect the rich. And if you're barely getting by, well, oh, well, hey, just be happy you have a job. Just be happy you have a job. Even if it's barely enough for you to subsist on, just be happy you have a job because the only reason you have a job is because we're making sure that those rich people don't have to pay any more taxes than is absolutely necessary. (laughs) And it turns out, It's apparently very easy to convince millions of people of that absurdity. So easy that decades later, they're still doing it. (laughs) That's the real big lie, right? You know, everybody talks about the big lie when Trump claims, you know, the election was stolen from him. That's, That's what everyone calls the big lie. And that is a pretty big lie. But I would say the real big lie that Republicans pulled is... Uh, convincing poor people uh, that we must protect rich people (laughs) no matter what. (laughs) That's the real big lie. Um, And that's also a very easy lie for for people to buy into. Um, But I I thought it was an interesting moment when, when Biden acknowledged that even he and President Obama thought the corporate tax rate had gotten too high, so they were fine with lowering it. Then again... Let us not forget, uh, it was also Biden and Obama during the Obama administration that were, and I don't know if it's fair to draw a direct line here or not, but I'll go ahead. Um, let's not forget, if if you were on Social Security, for example, they were perfectly happy and prepared to sell you out. That's something we must not ever forget. You know, I... I Many of you might not remember this, but it was um, coincidentally, it was during 2011. It was around the same time I started this show when I started doing it as a podcast before I, I brought the show here to WMNH. But um, and, and it was when they were fighting with the Republicans over the debt ceiling and John Boehner, who's been in the news lately because of his new book. But, uh, you know, he said, well, he thought the debt ceiling, the debt limit, the uh uh, fiscal cliff was uh, th- that that was a hostage worth taking and he was willing to uh, use that as a negotiating tactic over the budget with the uh, Obama administration and you may remember the phrase hearing the phrase grand bargain which was the Obama administration's idea for this this compromise that they were going to make with the Republicans to avoid uh, sending the federal government into default by not raising the debt ceiling on schedule And part of the grand bargain, which, ironically enough, Republicans rejected, so uh, millions of people weren't screwed by getting their Social Security cut, decimated really, uh, because Republicans didn't think that what the Democrats, what Obama and Biden were presenting went far enough, because if they're going to screw you, you know, they got to do it right. They got to really do it, not just somewhat do it, apparently. So Republicans rejected the deal. But Obama and Biden were on the verge of selling you out in order to, you know, because they felt that the corporate tax rate was too high. And this, by the way, is why people on the far left of the Democratic Party, if you want to call it the far left, I don't know, but, you know, people like Bernie, people like AOC, this is why they look at these sort of moderate corporate uh, Democrats as basically just being Republican light because on economic issues, that is what they are. That's certainly what Bill Clinton was. (laughs) Bill Clinton was no liberal. Bill Clinton signed welfare reform and other entitlement reform into law in his 
compromises with the Republicans. I'm not even making a judgment about whether he should or shouldn't have done that. Some would say he had his back against the wall and had no choice. But he was no liberal on economic issues. Hillary Clinton likely would not have been either had she won the presidency in 2016. There were certainly no indications that she would have been. You know, so we need to keep all this in mind and keep all this in perspective. So if you are someone who thinks that the corporate tax rate uh, was too low before, you know, was too low at lower than 35 percent. Well, remember, it was it was actually Obama and Biden that lowered it. And then, you know. Trump and the Republicans lowered it down to 21 percent. And even a lot of Republicans, you know, Republicans who didn't have elections to worry about, Republicans on cable news and whatnot were saying, well, wait a minute, Uh, this is too much. This is too much. There's no way. There's no way. Really, any Republican who had nothing to lose as far as uh, running for election or reelection would say, this is lowering it too much. You're going to blow a big hole in the deficit. Because there's no way you're going to make up, you know, unless you believe in unicorns and rainbows. And there's, there's, I mean, you should believe in rainbows. Rainbows are real, but that's a poor choice of words. But, you know, unless you believe in fairy tales, there's no way enough money is going to be made up. There's no way it's going to stimulate enough growth cutting the corporate tax rate to 21% to make up for the shortfall in tax revenue going into the treasury. There's no way. It is impossible. It's impossible. Everybody who didn't have an uh, an election to win said it's impossible. Everyone who did have an election to win said, oh, yeah, let's do this. Great. Because, you know, we'll just keep repeating the same lie we've been repeating for decades now because our, our base believes it. And so that's what they did. And look what happened. Of course... Uh, the deficit ballooned to record record numbers and, you know, uh, and Republicans went along with it because Republicans are only concerned about the deficit when there's a Democrat in the White House. When there's a Republican in the White House, they couldn't care less, couldn't care less about any of it. Stefan in the chat room says, by the way, when will the debt become a thing again? Well, you know, there, there's... See, that's the thing. You've got Republicans now who, you know, they're they're worried about, you know, they were worried about the stimulus being too big, Biden's stimulus being too big. They were worried about, uh, you know, the size of the uh, infrastructure package. They're worried about all that now. They weren't worried about any of it when Trump was president. They weren't worried about a thing. Weren't worried about a thing. Stefan points out our current senators, I think you mean ours in New Hampshire, uh, are Republican light. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're corporate, you know, they're they're your standard moderate corporate Northeastern Democrats. They're not they're not liberals by any stretch. Well, unless you're a conservative and, and you think all Democrats are liberals and all Democrats are part of the far left. And you've got these Republicans who talk about you know, uh, even talk about Joe Biden as all well, he's he's really just a puppet of AOC and the far left. Stefan said, OMG, don't even get me started on the great Reagan myth. Trickle down, LOL. What a con man. Hallelujah on the Reagan issue. Absolutely true. Scott Robinson says when Mexico pays for the wall, there will be no more debt. Well, I, I you know, they still haven't gotten the invoice. Anyway, there is more to this. Uh, about infrastructure, but we're out of time. Today went by very, very quickly. Thank you all so much. Uh, If you missed any part of today's show, it will be up in just a little bit at uh, mattconnerton.com and wmnhradio.org, and I will be back tomorrow. And uh, I'll leave you with this. Uh, I mentioned it earlier. Uh, You know, I'll use any excuse I can find to play a Kiss song, a little uh, unholy, (laughs) to wrap up today's show. And uh, Christian Lacoste is uh, planning on coming in uh, with me tomorrow. So he's, he is within the household. So he falls within our, our tight bubble that we have. All right, that's it for me for now. I'll talk to you all a little bit later. Bye, everybody.